Imagine for a second that we're not on some freezing cold ex-RAF airfield, but instead at a motor show with all the lights and glamour. Remember those? And there's going to be a new car unveiled. But before we get to that, I'm going to, going to tease a few of the headline details. So it's a pretty two-seater sports car from a historic brand. Crucially, it weighs just 931 kilos. Power, 240 brake horsepower, a manual gearbox, rear wheel drive, 0-64.1 seconds, and it costs less than a base Porsche Boxster. You'd be pretty excited, wouldn't you? I would be, certainly. So without further ado, I give you the new Los Solis Sport 240. But although this is a new car, after 25 years, this is also the final edition. Yes, after a quarter of a century, Lotus has announced that production of both the Elise and the Exige will finish this year. So it's marking the occasion with a couple of special run-out models, and we thought we'd take this Elise Sport 240 for a brief farewell drive around its home track at Hethel. Outputs from the supercharged four-cylinder are up by 23 brake horsepower and three pounds foot over the Sport 220, shaving a tenth from the 0 to 60 mile an hour time and boosting the top speed by a couple of miles an hour to 147. As well as the increase in power and the final edition decals, the car gets anthracite wheels as standard, a new TFT instrument pack, a new steering wheel, and the option of some special heritage paints. The price for all this? £45,500. And just in case you're wondering, yes, a roof is included in that price. But I'm kind of in the opinion that, um, well, if it's not actually raining, I'll have the roof off. Particularly when you've got a lovely bobble hat like this. I mean, it'd be a shame not to wear it, wouldn't it? So this is now the base of the Elise range. So it's not specifically set up for track work, but we are here at Hethel today. And it's so lovely being back in the Elise. I'll probably say that every time, but it's just so true. The feeling of a lack of weight is wonderful. This new steering wheel is lovely to hold, really ergonomic. Actually, a slightly flat bottom, which probably helps getting in and out just a touch. All the touch points really are lovely, actually, with Alcantara here. This gear shift with the exposed linkage, which, fair enough, you know, you're not looking down at it all the time, but it's beautiful knowing it's there. The pedals are perfectly placed too. In fact, the only thing I'd change would be the standard chairs, as I've always found them a little lacking in lateral support. So I'd plump for the optional sports seats, just for that last bit of connection, which is what the Elise is all about. What this car does is allow you to really get into the minutiae of driving. So. It's not a car for big skids, never has been really. And I'm as guilty as anybody for being a sucker for a bit of oversteer, but this car just lets you really concentrate on all the little things that you hear people like Rob Wilson talking about. I was listening to a podcast with him the other day, the Stage by Stage podcast, and being able to take all the little bits of advice that he gives and just try and work on them. And this is the car that you really want to try and improve your driving because every little bit of roll, bit of acceleration, little bit of steering, you notice through these long curves here, when you get it up to your right, you hardly need any steering at all. And you notice how the car rolls, particularly on this touring suspension rather than the, the cup or race suspension. Concentrate on getting your lines up to your right and feel when the front starts to scrub. Line it up, just try and tell yourself not to brake, maybe just to lift is enough. Just have confidence in the car because again, because it's so light weight, every input has an instant reaction. Anybody can get into something like this and feel the difference that they make with throttle and brake steering through here don't break just lift and you get it much smoother and this is a great circuit actually for trying this we're using the southern loop 
of Hassel today and fairly obviously this car should feel at home because it's its home track, it's where it's been developed. But what this track's great for is teaching you to really look ahead, link corners up because like this section here, if you get it absolutely right, you barely need any steering input, the kerbs just come out to meet you. Equally, through this section around here, you just feel the front there. You really know that you have to get each corner right, otherwise you mess up the whole sequence. It feels really quick as well, 240 brake horsepower. So that's double what the original S1 Elise had. And talking of the original, how would you like to hear four geeky facts about that car and its development? You'd be delighted, I can tell. So here goes. Fact number one. Let's talk about front tyre sizes. Because on the S1 Elise, the front tyres were always a bit too wide. They gave slightly interesting on-limit handling characteristics with just a bit too much front grip. It's why the S2 Elise went to a narrower front tyre. And I always wondered, well, why did they have such a wide front tyre? Surely they must have known it. And it was because Roman Artioli, who owned Lotus at the time, also owned Bugatti and wanted as much sharing of manufacturers as possible. So they had to use Michelin, and the smallest tyre that Michelin did for a 15-inch wheel was a 185. So there you are. Fact number two. We all know that at the heart of the Elise is its bonded extruded aluminium chassis, part of what makes it just so brilliant. But when they were developing this, because it was the first in the automotive sector, they had to find various sort of workarounds, one of which was actually getting the aluminium to stick to the bonding agent. And in order to do that, they had to coat the anodized piece of aluminium with a certain coating that was, well, like Teflon, really. So they used a non-stick coating to get it to stick. Fact number three is that originally there weren't going to be any doors. It was just going to be a step-through design because it was going to be a track car, so they didn't think they needed the practicality of these things, which is why the sills are quite so high. And why it's still actually, well, a bit awkward, certainly in the S1, to get in and out of. This is supremely flexible like me. Fact number four. The seating position, the, the ambiance in here, is something I remember particularly from the very early exiges as much as anything else. They always felt, well, a bit like a, a miniature Group C racer. And that's no coincidence, because when they were plotting this car, Richard Rackham and Julian Thompson, the designer, were walking around the Donington collection. And when nobody was looking, they sat in a few of the cars. And the one that really got them excited was a Group C racer with these big sills and down here, the slightly sort of wraparound windscreen. That's what they wanted. And I'd say that's what they got. The interior really has changed very little over the years. At times, more carpet, leather and alcantara has cloaked the aluminium in a bold attempt to lure Boxster buyers into the Little Lotus. But really, it has always been very light on luxury. You can put a bed in a tent, but that doesn't make it a hotel. To be honest, I wouldn't want it any other way. This new digital display in here, nice and simple. I've got it in the standard setting at the moment which apes, in fact, those, I think, those original stack dials you had. And then if you press sport down here, you get a bar across the top, which is certainly slightly easier in your peripheral vision to see. We've got some shift lights as well. We can come on just out of this corner here, actually, because it's quite easy to run into the limiter. It's quite a soft limiter, I quite like it. It's not a, not a harsh limiter. You just get bop, 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 which is quite fun, really. In the line, try and be neat. Grab another gear. The gear shift has certainly improved over the years. It used to be the case that you'd never really want to necessarily go for a gear as you were accelerating out of the corner when you were sort of off kilter because finding it would be a little tricky. One of the most fun things in this is the way that it rides the curbs through here. They might not be the most aggressive curbs, but it's just a beautiful way it floats across them. And just as lightness is notable in the ride, so it also makes itself felt under braking. The mixture of Brembo and AP racing calipers gripping AP discs all round. Bonus geeky Lotus fact, the first time AP racing brakes were fitted as standard to a road car was on the Lotus Carlton. In sport mode you also slacken off the 
ESC a little bit and get a slightly sharper throttle response. Just when you want it to be playful, that's where you don't get the rewards really with an Elise. But in this instance, I think I'm actually happy to sacrifice that. Neat and precise is the Elise way, always has been. And there is just so much feedback about how the car is moving around below the absolute limit of grip that you don't feel desperate to venture there. There was a great quote I heard the other day that Dave Minter, who's one of the people instrumental in bringing the Elise to market, said that Colin Chapman told him that a Lotus should be like a glove. Now we've all heard about the expression of it's, uh, you wear the car, but you can wear a baggy jumper. Colin Chapman took it a stage further, you, because a glove, every little reaction you make, it makes two. This is not a baggy jumper. This is definitely a glove. It is sad that this is the end of the Elise, but do you know what? Much as it feels like a wrench, I think it's probably the right decision. Not because there is anything cripplingly wrong with the Elise formula, far from it. If anything, it feels more fresh and relevant now than ever, but I think people are too used to it. Through familiarity, it gets overlooked and has done for some time. Because the engineering isn't new, it's assumed to be out of date, which really isn't the case. No, it's the right decision because it's time for a rebrand, so that a car from Lotus that weighs under a tonne, puts out good power to the rear wheels, has a manual box and possesses the legendary Lotus steering, can garner the sales it deserves. I don't know if that car is on the way, but it should be. Thank you, Elise. You've left big, lightweight shoes to fill. Yeah. Mm -hmm.